Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our latest Q&A session. Uh, today we've got uh, Andrew Wong with us who did uh, level three at Westminster and also then went on to the foundation degree. So we're going to kind of catch up with the impact that that's had with him. But um, obviously Andrew has, has gone on to, to have his own uh, restaurant or two and um, has also achieved a Michelin star. So I'd like to welcome Andrew aboard. Hi Andrew, how are you doing? Good morning. Perfect. Thank you for Good morning. having me. Technology doing? Not my thing. <laughs> Gotta be these days. <laughs> how are you, Andrew? You alright? Very well. Very well. Oh, I've, I've specifically set up this background to make it look like I read books, but actually <laughs> they're just for show. They're the children's ones, are they? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, can you just uh, let us know uh, a bit of your background? So, so obviously you did um, a level three with us, but before that, can you just go back to kind of your your growing up and, and your kind of experience with the restaurant industry throughout your childhood and things? Sure. So... Um... My, my parents had very, very traditional restaurants, uh, restaurants, uh, Chinese restaurant in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And um, I don't know if, if any of you guys have parents who are in the industry uh, who have owned, I don't know, cafes or takeaways or whatnot. But basically, the, uh, the one motivation for studying extra hard growing up was to not have to help in the restaurant. Um, so I would do extra homework, extra math, extra science to not have to help out in a restaurant. Um, but when I was at uh, university, so I, I studied chemistry at, um, at Oxford and I got thrown out because I was a, a lazy twat. Um, and then I, I studied uh, social anthropology at the University of London. And while I was there, my father passed away. So I just went into the kitchen to help out. And while I was helping out, you know, I thought, oh, there's this Caton College around the corner. I thought, well, why don't I just apply? Um, and and the day I went in, I don't think they were rolling for level two. So I just decided to wing it and apply for level three. But I knew nothing about European cooking, like absolutely nothing. And for some reason, they let me on. I don't know why. And I had this teacher called um, Mr. Gardner. And I remember the first day I went in and they told me to zest an orange. But I don't know if you know this, but in Chinese cuisine, we use dried orange peel as a as a medicinal ingredient. But you use the whole peel. You like rip the skin off and you leave it to dry. So he told me to zest this orange and I started ripping the whole skin off um, instead of zesting it with a, with a grater. And he looked at me and he, he wasn't quite sure whether or not I was joking or taking a taking a mickey. Um, but but over the year, um, he, he, he kind of, he taught me, he taught very, very classical um, European French cooking, which you guys probably know. Um, and, and I find it fascinating because it was so different to what I'd ever done. And it was so different to what we were doing in a restaurant. Um, and also, I just love the fact that so much of French cooking, it's just a load of mumble jumble, just kind of given really fancy names. But actually, it's stuff is very, very simple. Um, and then once you get your mind over the fact that it's just a load of mumble jumble to confuse you, then actually it's just about cooking really delicious food. Um, he kind of understood that I, I got that very, very fundamental thing, which basically no matter how you do it, the end product, as long as it's delicious, um, it's good. And he would address with me the technical faults that I'd done and the things that I didn't know about, which were loads at the time. Um, and, and by the end of the course, I remember he, he said to me that um, he thought I was one of the the most improved students. I think that was only because I started off at such a low level. Um, <laughs> but he, he did teach me massively because remember this was the first ever experience I'd ever had learning any European cooking. Um, and obviously working in the Escoffier kitchen was the first time I'd done um, service in a European kitchen where, where the setup is very, very different to any Chinese kitchen. You know, the way you have sections and it all comes to the pass, it's very, very different to a Chinese cooking where it's all mise en place heavy and everything is a la minute. So that was fascinating. And then, then I, I, I left um, the NVQ level three 
um, and I did the foundation degree uh, whilst at university and helping out at the restaurant. Um, so I used to wake up, uh, go to university. Sometimes I do prep in the morning, go and do like a, a 9.30 to 11.30 class at the University of London. Um, and then I would uh, come back, do a little bit more prep in the restaurant. Um, and then I'd go to do the um, the NVQ, no, the foundation degree course. Well, I'd skip a lot of the science courses because they were pretty easy at the time because I'd done a degree in chemistry and I'd show up to like the food courses um, and then I'd go back to do dinner service. Um, and then after that, I decided that um, I'd go to China because I wanted to take some time off and um, I wanted to, I wouldn't say I wanted to learn loads about Chinese cooking. I was, I was fascinated by Chinese cooking and I had friends who were GMs of big hotels and I had chefs who were quite big chefs in, in, in Hong Kong and China. So I thought I'd just go and hang out with them. Um, and you guys are what, 17, 18 now. Um, and, and I can't encourage you enough to go out and, and, and travel and to work abroad. And while you do these experiences, naturally, you're just going to mess around. You're going to, you know, I remember I was in a hotel and if you go look at a Chinese kitchen, a roasting chef who does suckling pig, Peking duck, uh, crispy pork belly, they always have their own separate kitchen. And they have their own working hours because if we're doing banquets for 2,000 people in the morning, we would come in at 11 p.m. the night before and basically roast through the whole night and then cut the meat for the banquet between 12 and 1 and then we'd go, we'd go home. Um, so they would, he would basically be his own chef in his tiny little kitchen and we'd be sitting there in the kitchen smoking whilst roasting this meat. Um, but that was just the social norm in, in China. It's like in, in China, the, the thing is that if a chef gives you a cigarette and you say no, it's like a, a sign of disrespect. And I was basically asking the chef to try to teach me. Now, I wouldn't encourage you guys who don't smoke to just to go and smoke to do it. But at the time, we're talking about, you know, in early 2000, just 2000 and whatever it was early. And I was very, the one thing I was always very comfortable with is that, you know, to stay humble and to be respectful of anyone who was willing to teach me anything at the time. You know, and if that meant I had to, smoke a cigarette whilst writing down some notes or or have a beer with him whilst whilst roasting some suckling pig then then so be it um and then that got me to the point where we came back and uh, my family restaurant had kind of been run down to the ground at the time because we'd let other people run it and so my wife and i decided to shut it down and to um reopen it with some new ideas of what i thought about chinese cooking um i don't know if you guys know but china it's a big, big country. Um, you know, it has 1.6 billion people and it has 14 different countries that border it. So when you talk about Chinese cuisine, it, it, it's actually a meaningless term. It's like saying, you know, European cuisine. You know, I cook European food. food. It, it means nothing. It means everything and nothing. So when we decided to do that, we decided to basically strip the restaurant back and just have a restaurant where food was more informal and there's a little bit more... Um, adventurous in a way that it it celebrated lots of different areas of China as opposed to being just Cantonese or just Sichuanese or just being Western Chinese. And then from there, I'm not going to lie, you know, um, life just rolls sometimes, you know, when we opened, I remember the first day we opened, my wife and I just said, you know what, let's just hope that we get some customers. We stare at the door, remember this. We stayed at the door. We didn't have enough money to renovate half the restaurant, so we could only own, open that upstairs. And we couldn't afford heating in a restaurant. So people would basically go into the toilet, come out shivering. And every night we'd just stare at the front door, hoping someone would come in. And for the first three months, you guys might have the opportunity to suffer this, but it was a nightmare, like an absolute nightmare. We were just winging it. And every day it was like a, I don't want to swear, but a shitstorm. Um, I lost, I lost maybe 40 chefs in a, in a month um, because I wasn't in a very good place mentally at the time either. Um, when you open a restaurant, it kind of does that to you. Um, but but naturally, we, we started to tweak. Um, and the one thing I can tell you guys is that I don't really value myself as a particularly talented chef, but I do think that I'm quite hardworking. And when things go wrong, um, I try to fix them. I don't sit there and I don't cry about it and I don't uh, moan and I don't go, oh, this other person's got this. I don't have it. Why do they have this? Why don't, why don't I? 
I'm very good at just being very methodical and just going, okay, we've effed up. Let's fix it and let's move on and let's see what happens. And for about three months, we just tweaked and tweaked and tweaked. And obviously we lost chefs because I wasn't in a great place. But I remember by January, we had Faye Mashler from the Evening Standard come in. And we had a way to just start. He dropped a whole glass of water all over her <laughs> and when she came into the restaurant. And then she came back a second time. And I think we didn't drop anything on her that day. I think we might have made some mistakes on her order too. But luckily, she, she looked at me and she looked at my wife, who, who we were working together, and she saw that we were, you know, we were hardworking and that we were humble and that we were just try, two nice people trying to do something slightly different in the industry. And from then, I don't know, you know, you guys, I don't need to follow restaurant critics, but once you have one review, and especially it's on Faye Mashler, they all just come in afterwards. They, everyone just snowballs into the restaurant. So one led to another, led to another. And, you know, we were very lucky, probably out of 10 reviews, but eight of them were very, very good. Um, and then from then, you know, things snowballed and and led to, you know, the very, very fortunate things that have, have uh, come our way since. Yeah, so I mean, I've been to China a couple of times and I think fundamentally the, the food that we experience on the whole of, of Chinese cuisine over here is is pretty much based on Cantonese, mostly I guess due to to the, the immigration that we had here. I guess people came from Hong Kong because they couldn't really come from anywhere else in China because it's such a kind of locked down place generally anyway. Um, but certainly the food that you're doing I know that you promote in terms of it's your take on Chinese. So you're not saying this is the most authentic Chinese food you're going to get, but this is your interpretation. So in terms of you spent six months in China, um, just to put it into, I mean, China is bigger than the size of Europe. How, how do you get your head around all the different provinces and, and the different styles of cuisine and actually bring this down to individual dishes and then ultimately a menu you know what um we always say six months in the press but actually i'd been going back to china like on a regular basis beforehand um and actually the six months i did spend there a lot of it was messing around i'm not gonna lie we worked but a lot of it was kind of subconscious appreciation of culture i think that's the best thing i think if you go traveling to try to just steal people's recipes you will miss so much. So if you go, if you guys go abroad and you go to Greece and you go, I'm going to go to, I don't know, some Greek island because I want to learn their cuisine. You go there with a notepad and you just basically spend your whole time writing down measurements and writing down, you will miss so much and you'll miss the bigger picture of what is going on. And all you really need to do, and when I, I travel this a lot, what I realised is that so much of it is about the recipes, but the recipes you can work out afterwards. What is more important is understanding what that food means to people and what is the flavor that they, and the flavor and the meaning behind that food that they're trying to transfer to the people that they're feeding. So I can give you a very good example of this, right? Because no food is universal. So, you know, nowadays, you know, chefs go, oh, this is the perfect risotto or this is the perfect fried rice or this. It's all PR rubbish. It like it's chefs like me who say stuff in the press and then people run with it and make out that it's fact. There is no single dish in the whole world where there is a very, very strict criteria of what is the best version and what is the worst version. I've been to places in China where egg fried rice is soft and mushy. I've been to places where the egg fried rice, people like it, where it's very, very granular and, and the, 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 the rice is slightly al dente and some people might call it slightly uncooked. I've been, you know, I, there is no such thing. So the important thing to do when you go to these areas is to understand the fundamental behind the half technique, how they use the wok. So that is that is the real fundamental behind it. The, the, the technical ability of how do they control their wok? At what point, at what heat do they put the aromats in? What order do they put aromat, protein, sauce, fermented good, reduce it? This is the order. If you break that down into like a bigger picture, then you understand the cooking in inverted commas a little bit better. 
And then when you go to different areas, you don't just look for recipes. You look for the, the larger differences. So you go to the Western China and you're like, wow, there's so many mosques here. You're like, why are there so many mosques in this part of China? I didn't know there were Muslims in China. And then you go, OK, you look at their cuisine and go, OK, naturally, there's not going to be any pork because it's a it's an Islamic country, uh, Islamic state. So then you go, OK, so if they don't use pork, what do they use in their dumplings to, to, to add that fat? Or what do they add to their dumplings to make it, you know, a little bit um, less soft in texture? What do they, you know, they're using tandoors. So we use tandoors in Western China. Why are you using tandoors? You begin to look at this. OK, you're using tandoors because... Actually, historically speaking, the Western part of China links onto Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and the ex-Ottoman Empire, which they, they use Persian influences. So things like we have naan breads, literally called naan bread in China. It uses a tandoor, it looks slightly different. And once you understand these larger pictures, when you come back, it's a lot easier to write a menu because you're not just looking through a notepad. I mean, you know, I've got a notebook of I've got a notebook of recipes here that, that I write down all the time. I've got like 50 of them in my, but they're not the useful things. Once they're in the book, I rarely go back to them. What is more important is the memory. OK, I remember this. I remember that. I want to I want to try to encapsulate that magic of getting a tandoor using Chinese-esque flavours, which they were using in that part of China yet respecting the tandoor and giving that barbecue flavor, which you don't normally see in a lot of Chinese cooking, into a dish. So when you say that my food is, it's, it's my interpretation of Chinese food. Actually, the more I cook, the more backwards I become to go, actually, in the sense that I, I'm, I'm becoming less adventurous with my food and actually becoming more and more. The more I cook, the more I'm trying to seek um, old fashioned techniques. And, and techniques, I'm not talking about recipes, I'm talking about techniques. So, you know, things like certain wrapping techniques. Um, I'm not trying to come up with my own wrapping technique. It's about employing the best dim sum chefs I can find and wrapping with them every day. I'm not going to lie. Every morning between uh, 9 and 11.30, I will spend that time with the dim sum team wrapping with them. I don't it's not about me telling them. I mean, I can tell them how I want something to look and I can tell them how I want something to taste. But when it comes to the actual physical dexterity, they're way better than me because they've been doing it for 30 years. You know, and, you know, some of the items I can probably come pretty close to them, but I don't sit there and I don't tell them, go, oh, do it my way, because actually they might do it differently to my way, but their end product is better than mine. Mm. So, you know, even with a, with a porn ha gal, for example, I've re learned and relearned how to wrap that same dumpling maybe seven times, depending on the person that I'm wrapping with, because I want to know how they wrap it. Now, I know how I wrap it. Um, and I started off like, you know, cheating like all of you guys when or a lot of chefs that I see when they try to cook Chinese food and they just bodge up some random way of wrapping a dumpling. But actually, it's very specific. You know, certain dumplings have 13 pleats. Certain dumplings have 18 pleats. You know, there's a very specific elasticity that you're using to the dough. You know, some doughs we need to sheet it 30, 40 times in the morning before we rest it and wrap it. Other doughs we have to use it straight away. Other, you know, we have about 30 different starches in the kitchen. And beforehand I would have gone, ah, don't worry about it. Let's just, let's just get some like Gordon Ramsay pasta recipe out and just use that as a seal my thing. And actually the more I learn, it's like that's massively disrespectful to my culture, myself. Um, and actually, even if, there is no difference in the end product. It makes me feel better that I've done things respectfully um, to myself and my culture. But I think you, you certainly having and been to your restaurant, a big part of the experience going to yours is that front of house interaction that you get more than most other places where they, they're coming in and they're not just putting the food in front of you, but they're, they're taking you on the journey you've been on in that sense. So. How, how do you develop the front of house team from that point of view? You know, and you know, people always say this, you know, you, you I always hear chefs, you know, now there's loads of TV programs about service industry, right? And they go, oh, you know, I think the service is even more important than the food. Now, you might think that I'm just saying this because I'm a chef, but I think it's bullshit. Like the food is what gets people through the door. The service is what gets people coming back. And I think people need to understand that. But the service is never more important than the food. Like, you know, 
I've been to many restaurants. I don't care how good the service is. If the food is rubbish, I'm not coming back. You know, but if the service is really poor, I'll give it at least one more chance before I come back and before I decide whether or not to come back. But I grew up in a in a in a generation where Chinese restaurants were famous for having poor service. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, you, you guys probably didn't grow up in the eighties, but but you know, we're talking about first generation Chinese immigrants who didn't speak Chinese, and they opened like my parents, they opened restaurants um, as a as a means to to earn money to basically pay for me to get an education so I wouldn't have to be in hospitality. So I'd go on to be a doctor, a lawyer, um, a, a, a judge, you know, a chemical engineer or something and, and not be part of the hospitality industry. And, you know, I don't guys, you, you know this, but actually this, this whole uh, kudos that comes around being a chef is actually very, very recent. You know, if you talk about 15 years ago, you know, being a chef was not, a revered, a revered um, a career path, you know. It was it was no different to being kind of like you know a mechanic, you know. But people, you know, only now do people really begin to get this kudos with the media, with these massive PR machines that that basically back up um, very average chefs like myself. Um, and and basically, when it comes to the service part, we realise that you know number one. Service is important to, to me and Natalie because when we opened a restaurant, it was a very, very simple criteria. We wanted to open a restaurant that we would want to go to. And I grew up in London. Natalie was born in the Seychelles, um, where there's five star hotels everywhere uh, and, and people need to be looked after. So our only aspiration really with regards to the service was to help us create an environment where people would be feeling like they're part of our home. And as the food evolved, Naturally, the service has to evolve. And people talk about Michelin stars and this and that. Number one, anyone of you who is aspiring to win a Michelin star, you have to, number one, realise that you don't win Michelin stars. They're not for you to win. They're just given to you by a random arbitrary body. There, there, is, no, there is no criteria. I mean, I've spoken to many Michelin inspectors. There is no criteria. They pride themselves fact that they don't have a criteria. The only criteria they have is one star worth a special journey, two star worth an extra special journey, three star there's personality in the cuisine and worth an extra extra special journey. That is the only criteria. You do not win this. This is not like Usain Bolt going to the Olympics. You know, just because I have a star and someone else doesn't, it doesn't make them worse than me. I know loads of chefs who are way more talented than me. And they don't have a star, right? And if any of you think that this is something that you can win, you've got to get out of your head now. Because if you think like that, you're going to batter yourself mentally into the ground. And chances are you're going to be one of those really try hard chefs who are constantly just trying to copy people who have stars. And then you will never win one. Um, but at the same time, you also have to make that decision of do you want to do this? Because no matter how you define Michelin, if it's important, if it's not important, that it is just an arbitrary body. The one thing that is universal is that you cannot do it whilst being lazy. That is the only, you know, you cannot win a star by being lazy. And so the, the, the only thing that I really pride myself on when it comes to win a Michelin star is not that I think that I'm better than or the cuisine has somehow hit some kind of random level. It's the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a gold stamp that someone said, you know what, you've worked hard. And your the, the result of what you've of your hard work has resulted in a product which okay we think is is good, but actually it, the, the product isn't what is important. The the importance to me is the fact that I know for a fact if I look across all the chefs with a star, none of them are lazy bastards. And the fact that I can now put myself into that category and I can go and hang out with them with the Joneses now, and that I can have Albert Adria's phone on a uh, phone number and I can WhatsApp him now and this and that. That is what is important to me. Um, and and if anything, the only thing that I pride myself on in comparison to all my peers is the fact that actually we won a Michelin star with 11 chefs who all started off as kitchen porters with me. And to me, that is way, way bigger an achievement than 
you know, coming up with some of the most amazing food that I see that Claude makes, the food that Claire Smith makes, you know, okay, that's great. But, you know, I won a Michelin star with 11 kitchen porters. Um, and to me, that is probably always going to be one of the greatest achievements. Brilliant. So, so what kind of impact do you think doing the, the foundation degree had on your journey as well? Because we, we've got level three students who are going to graduate this year um, and and there'll be there'll be some of them who are thinking they're going to go off to work and some who are thinking do I carry on my kind of education and and the, the foundation degree is the obvious next step what what difference does it has it made for you personally um you know the foundation degree was um very very important to me personally um and I was the first year that ever did it. So it was a bit, you know, it was a bit um, kind of rough around the edges when, when I did it. You know, it was a bit um, kind of improvising of, of how we teach the, the kind of the, the random group of people that you collect from that course. You know, there's, there's kind of people from the industry. There's people who want to be chefs. There's people who want to be teachers. There's people who want to be upper management in, in certain places. Now, how do you teach a course um, which, which gives you the skills to excel within all those fields. It's difficult. Um, just before we talk about um, the, the, the foundation degree, I want to just say that with the level three NVQ, I think that, you know, the guys, you guys, the guys and ladies who are graduating from it today, I think, you know, to me, what was massively important, those, some of those skills that you learn from the NVQ level three, they're so important because nowadays in the economic world we live in, no restaurant is going to do those, some of that stuff anymore. You know, I'm not being bad, but as a business owner, so the restaurant that we own in, in Cannon Street, where we do 200 covers a day, there is no financial sense in making our own stock every day, right? There is no, there's no, there is absolutely no reason to make our stock every day and bring young commies in at 7 a.m. to start making stock every day. It's a waste of time. It's dirty. Uh, it takes up too much space. It uses up too much space in the kitchen. It wastes manpower. And a lot of the time, because you're relying on a commie to do it, it's not as um, consistent as if I take it out to an outsource, out somewhere in zone six somewhere, who they've got exact laboratory conditions with an exact recipe that I give them. And they churn it out and they deliver it to me in a vat bag, like frozen down in 20, 30 gallons, and we pour it out. So those skills in making a really delicious stock those skills in like random stuff, you know, like making, you know, bechamels or roux and stuff. I mean, making roux again in this day and age when health is of importance, there is zero point in using roux anymore. There's so many thickeners we can use. We can use gelan, we can use agar, you know, all these methacel. We can use so many different uh, um, alternatives that don't leave calories in your stomach that there's no reason for them. But it's important to know them. And I think those skills of level three are the most important skills that I took away because no matter now, wherever I go to work, I know for that I can still make a stock. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, just I don't think that it's just something I pick out of the cold room, you know, but there are people who haven't had that training who generally just don't know how to make a stock. Um, if you ask them to make a brown stock or a white, they just don't know how to do it. Uh, when it comes to the um, foundation degree, I, uh, um, Mr. Tinton was our uh, was our uh, our teacher, and I remember the most important thing that we learned from that course was that it it removed the um, the box that everyone was sitting in. So you know, everyone was sitting in a box of things you can do, things you can't do. You know, we, we this is in the early two thousands. You know, if you're cooking this dish. You have to do it this way. You have to do this. You have to use this ingredient. You have to use that ingredient. You must reduce it this way. You mm -hmm. must use this thickener. And I remember, you know, Mr. Tinton was very, very um, accommodating in just going, you know what? Just go try it. You know, it doesn't matter if it, if it, if it works out or it doesn't work out. It doesn't, you know, I'll give you 50 potatoes. I want you to go and pick the right potato to make this specific dish. I'm like, how, what, when, where, how? He's like, just go try it. And then afterwards, we discuss it afterwards. And it was that thought process and that thinking process that was actually more important than the rest of it. 
Um, you know, at the time we were doing a lot of the stuff that like, kind of recreate dishes from Elinia, recreating dishes from El Bulli, this kind of stuff. And all that stuff has kind of gone out of fashion now. And um, so it's not important. But the important thing is this idea. And it's why El Bulli is so important as a, as a restaurant and why Albert and Farana are so important as chefs. It's because they completely changed the playing ground for all of our chefs. So now chefs can do anything. You guys, when you go out and write your own menus or, you know, do whatever you want, we come up with dishes. Now there is no stigma about using any ingredient or any technique with any dish that you put on it. It doesn't matter if you're at the Ivy or you're at the, um, you know, at A Wong or you're at Gordon Ramsay, you can use chili, you can use this, you can use coriander, you can use lemongrass now. You can, you, all these ingredients are, are for you to use. You can use Cantonese suckling pig techniques in a European restaurant now. now in the early 2000s, that, that was like a no-no. Like you just wouldn't do it. You know, if you're Spanish, you would cook your suckling pig the way Spanish people cook suckling pig. And anyone blind tasting would tell you a Cantonese suckling pig is better than a Spanish one. And that's not just me because I'm Chinese. I'm talking from a purely a taste perspective. The skin is crackling more and the meat is softer and it's more flavorful. Brilliant. Um, so we've had a question come in. So you talked about um, Faye Ashler and the, the impact that she had and, and other critics and things like that. But the kind of question is, these days we've got social media, we've got uh, things like TripAdvisor and things like that. So do you think people really need restaurant cricket critics to uh, to judge whether they're going to go and visit a restaurant? Um, yes and no, I think is the right idea. Put it this way. When my second restaurant opened, it wasn't ready. Uh, it wasn't ready and we should have postponed the opening by probably a month and we rushed it. Um, and because this was our second restaurant, I remember we were standing there on day one and I looked around the dining room. There, were, there was basically every single journalist from the whole of the UK sitting in the dining room on our first service. And I was going around talking, I went around to the Faye first and then I had to jump over and pretend I was doing some real work and then had to go and talk to Marina O'Glocklin at the Times. And then there was, uh, uh, there was Joe Warwick sitting in the other corner or something. There were two journalists sitting together. And the reviews came out, and honestly speaking, I, I, hand on heart, if I was rating the food at that restaurant at the time, I would have given it six out of 10. Um, these critics, they came in and they, 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 they liked A Wong and they, they believed in me, and we got five star reviews all across the board. Like, um, I don't know, maybe I'm being hard on myself, but hand on my heart, I honestly tell you that I don't think the food was as good as it needed to be at the time. Um, and, you know, it will always improve. But we got five star reviews, 10 out of 10, most of the near local, and then the restaurant got packed. And I'm talking about packed for four months. Now, no trip advisor or sh shit advisor of you is going to pack your restaurant for four uh, A journalist, uh, across the board will create a buzz that can pack your restaurant for four months. You know, no, no social media post, no Instagram post is going to pack your restaurant for four months. But journalists, they can pack your restaurant for four months. So is it important still? Yes. Do I know why? No. But all I can tell you is that my restaurant was full for four months. Brilliant. Okay. And um, so in terms of, you, you, no, I'm not saying you're name dropping, but the, the, the the kind of circles you move in now is opened up. But in terms of earlier on in your career, who do you think um, was the most inspirational for you and who and who's had such a, an impact on your journey? You know what? It, it, it's a funny one because obviously my first teacher was going to be a, a big one. right? So Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Tintin. And it's nothing to do about knowledge. It was about accepting that I was so stupid and accepting that my skill level was so low and and bearing with me and 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 no and uh, maybe they did it just out of like uh, sympathy it was a fact that i was so, i remember i just i knew nothing i i was absolutely winging it like while i was at college and they never ever like laughed in my face they kept a straight face every single time that i screwed up and they just said hmm, maybe, 
Uh, but they didn't ridicule me. They, and I could have taken it. I mean, I was a big boy at the time. I was like 21 at the time. I could have taken a, a rinsing out, no problem. But they never, ever did. They, they, they shouldn't think, you're shit. You're, you know, you're, you're not. And maybe it was because I was, you know, I, I've always maintained to be humble and I've always maintained to be a nice person, whoever I'm dealing with. Um, so they will always be very strong in my memory. Uh, if we talk about later on in the industry, there are certain people who are... Um, massively important and they're massively important because they're nice people um so i you know i'm very very lucky in the sense that over the eight years that we've been open we've probably had most if not most of the world's famous chefs come to the restaurant we cook for them you know we're talking about ferran uh, albert pierre kaufman you know uh, marco pino white um, the ones I really remember are the ones who are nice, nice people. So Pierre is an obvious one. Pierre is an incredible guy. Um, he'll come to the restaurant and he'll come in after. And we're, we're, you know, he, he's very honest with me now. So if he doesn't like something, he'll come up to the kitchen and he'll he'll pull me aside and he'll say, Andrew, today that chili beef was shit. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and like, I, I do not know why, like, uh, the beef was not as soft as last time. And I, I'll go, yes, Pierre, um, I'm really sorry. Uh, and then next time we'll, we'll address it. And then when he does like something, he'll go, Andrew, you know, you've got this, you know, this new dish on it. I really like it. And, and that is, that is so meaningful as a chef, as opposed to chefs who just come in and just, you know, they just eat the food and leave. Another one's Chris Galvin. So Chris Galvin is one of the nicest people um i've ever met like not even just the industry just a genuinely um, a nice person who is caring and what i've always remember about him is there is no bullshit so you guys when you when you you know when you spend more time in the industry you'll start hanging out with more chefs who are head chefs and and what you'll think what you'll realize is that a lot of chefs they sugarcoat everything so they always go, yeah, you know, life is great. You know, everything is great. We did a thousand million covers yesterday. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm really thinking this. I'm thinking that. It's amazing. Everything is great. You know, our simile is great. Our wine, everything is great. You know, life is great. Um, my personal life is great. But actually, the, the hostel industry isn't great um, all the time. And the one thing I remember about Chris is that he would be very, very brutally honest. And he would say that, Andrew, you know, we're really struggling uh, with this and we're really struggling with that. And from that, you can learn and you can you can go, yeah, Chris, you know, I'm, I was actually I was a little bit reluctant and a bit shy to tell you. But, yeah, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm suffering from the same thing. And then he'll go, oh, you know, well, I tried this and I tried that. And and, you know, that is that is so humbling when you realize that, you know, I, I as a head chef, we go into work every day pretending that we know the answers. Right. So I have to go into work every single day and I have to give the team the um the, the, the psychological understanding that no matter how bad it gets, the chef will be able to help you. A lot of the time, I don't have the answers. Right? I really don't. But I need to give them the assurance and the reassurance that it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter if the gas goes out and the electricity and, you know, kitchen port doesn't show up and two communes show up. It doesn't matter. If chef is here, we'll work our way through it. And I can honestly tell you, we've done services where the extraction's gone out. We had iPhone taped to our chest so that we could see what we were cooking, just because we had a full dining room at the time, and we lit the whole dining room with candles, and they were all, where's my food, where's my food? And we were all dripping with sweat because there was no extraction. I won't tell you why the interlock didn't work, um, but um, we, we just got through it. And at the end of the day, it was just like, all right, it's okay. But you know, when you meet people who are willing to guide you through that, um, it's very, very humbling. Uh, and of course, recently, Mm. Um, you know, re recently, if you talk about, um, you know, it's not necessarily the, the head chef, they're not the, not the chef owners, but the head chefs of the mm. restaurant. So Francisco, who is uh, Claude's head chef at the Bendham, an incredible guy. Like again, I just look at, I look at his working hours, and I look at the way that he's, he's, he's fighting every day for his dream, which is to win three stars. And I have absolute admiration for the fact that it's not just talking. It's every day. You go in at 7 in the morning and you finish up 1 a.m. You don't moan. You get on with it because there's a bigger dream out there. And I'm going to try to push everyone to try to achieve this dream with us. Um, and I admire that massively. And then when you talk about creativity, no, no one beats uh, Ferran and Abba Adria. Um, 
and then I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show off a bit here. But he invited me to Spain uh, about two months ago, and uh, basically we we for a weekend we just ate in all his restaurants together, and he showed me um, his his uh, research center and how he does his dish development, um, and how he comes up with new dishes. And the beauty of it, if you look at someone like him, he's such a grounded guy. Like you would expect him to be like, uh, you know, like a rock star. You know, you'd expect him to go like, you know, who who are you? You're like some random Chinese chef from the UK. Why am I even talking to you? Um, but he, he, we sat down together, we drank together, we ate together. Um, and and the one thing I remember is with all these cookbooks, and I've got all of his cookbooks. Like it looks so scientific. But when you watch the way that he works, he literally, he has his laptop and all his restaurants are within walking distance inside in Barcelona. He goes to one restaurant, he sits down, he opens his laptop, the head chef comes along, he goes to the staff, head chef brings in like six or seven things, he just tastes them like this, and then he goes, blah, 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 I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know what he said. Blah, 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 blah. And then he'll pass it over to me and we'll taste it and he'll go, well, what do you think, Andrew? And then, you know, I'm like, this. Yeah, you obviously you're saying you talk shit. So you go, oh yeah, it's really good, but <laughs> um, 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 and then and then basically he he goes back and he gives the recommendation. They go back and they do it. It's not a laboratory. And he told me that he fired both his he, he got rid of his development kitchen because he wants his chefs in house to be able to cook real food now. So when he does the encyclopedia and stuff, they'll break it down. They'll give a recipe that is exact grand. But the day-to-day -day running of the restaurant is run by chefs tasting. And that is, uh, is a massive, massive turning point for me because it made me realise that, you know, you know that scale that you've got, you know, all right, it's great for the pastry kitchen most of the time. But for the most, especially with Chinese cooking, where sauces reduce in six or seven seconds, just don't worry too much about the recipe. Just taste it. Just taste it and trust yourself. You know, but that does come with with implications like it means that you have to know what you like and uh, and i don't want to sound generic and kind of like uh just overarching when i say this i think that a lot of the young chefs who are in their you know either teens or early early 20s they spend their whole life on instagram so much is visual that they completely forget you know what taste is number one and number two they have you i don't know i'll say they they have no idea what they like and what they don't like so when you ask them, well, young chefs now, you go, what do you like? They go, oh, yeah, I really love that dish at 11 Madison Park. And you look at it, it's got like 70 ingredients on it. You're like, you can't taste 70 ingredients. Your, taste, your tongue can only taste five ingredients. That's biological fact. So oh, what do you mean you like that dish at 11 Madison Park? And you look at it, it's like, okay, what did you like about it? Because, oh, I just love this. And I, I love the fact that, you know, he sous vide this and then he, he smoked this and he put lavender all over this. I was like, no, do you really, did you really like the flavour or are you just saying that? And the responses that I get from young chefs a lot of the time, from my inkling, is they just follow what other people say about the food, right? They just go, oh, that person, you know, oh, you know, this other chef said that that's the best steak in the whole world. Yeah, that's the best steak in the whole world. You know, another, another chef goes, yeah, you need to sous vide all your beef at 54 degrees for 22.6 minutes. And then sear it in a pan, and that's the best steak in the world. Full stop. I'm not going to tell you. Like, it, taste is completely subjective. Number one, right? Number two, what you're describing is fast, right? Sous vide. Like, I, you know, I, I used to use sous vide a lot, but why? Because I had to cook loads of steaks really quickly. Okay? But if you actually blind taste a piece of barbecue or oven pan seared beef with a bit of sous vide beef and you cook them correctly, no one in a blind taste is going to say a sous vide piece of beef tastes better. I'm really sorry. Like, that's my perspective. And the one thing about Chinese food and Chinese chefs is that they're always massively like functional. So I might come to a China, I do, I do um, what are they called? Forehand dinners or whatever that stuff is called, like in with, with Chinese chefs all over the world. And whenever I bring my cook in there, they look at it and go, why did you bother do that? Why did you bother do that? And you know what? Because Chinese is like, it's so functional. It's all about flavour. It's all about freshness. Right? And I, I, I'll give you guys another story. Right? So half of the Western world now is obsessed with Japanese ways of treating fish. Right? So, so nowadays, nobody wants fresh fish anymore. You know, everybody wants to get their fish, 
fillet it, salt it, leave it in a cold room for three days, and then cook it. Why? Because, you know, they say that you draw out the water, you uh, increase the umami inside the fish, so that the fish tastes better. All right, I get it. I, I go to uh, a very, very famous three-star Japanese restaurant, where before you go into the restaurant, they give you a list of 50 things that you can't do when you're in the dining room, and you're paying £350. So anyway, the chef comes in, and he, he brings out this fish, and he goes, I have... I have brined this fish in soy sauce for five days, and it's the maximum that you can brine this piece of fish in before it goes on the turn. I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm really, really sorry, guys, but if I bought a piece of fish from Tesco Value and I brined it in soy sauce for five days, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that piece of fish and this 150 pound a kilo piece of fish after it had been brined for five days. And anyone who says that they can, you're lying to yourself. You're not being, you're not being truthful to yourself. But, but dining out isn't about that, right? Dining out is about the ambience, the fact that, you know, this really famous three-star chef comes along and gives you all these orders, things you can and can't do. And you believe in gospel at any reason. But taste-wise, I'm sitting there like, it can't be true. It just can't be true. And so anyway, every chef that blind puts their fish, right? So cold rooms are now filled with fish that's been lightly salted, just air drying for three or four days before they pan to anything now. So, okay, all fish now has a firmer texture. I get it. But I go to Macau to um, a, a three-star three restaurant in a, in a big famous hotel. And all their fish out of the tank, onto the board, whack. The, the fish is still moving. You fillet it, you slice it, and you put it straight into the steamer, straight away. And so I'm, I'm talking to the chef after, after service one day, and I'm like, you know, well, you know, what do you think about this, this, this Japanese um, idea of, of brining fish um, to concentrate the flavour um, and drawing out the water? Um, to, he goes, Andrew, you know, that's, that's Japanese food. That's, that's fine. And, I, you know, it does do that stuff. But when I, I'm a Cantonese chef and what we value more than anything is texture. So he says that when I look at fish, I look at texture. So when I want that piece of fish, and we're talking about it's a really, really famous like red grouper, which is like it's a hundred dollars a kilo, which is the most expensive fish in the world. He goes, when I eat that fish and it's fresh out of the tank into the steam, when I eat it, because it's still rigor mortis in it, the flesh souffles. And that's what I want from fish. I want the fish to have a souffle texture. And I'm sitting there like, but what do you think about the flavour aspect? He said, Andrew, with Cantonese food, you know, you have to make a decision with your dish. What do you want it to be? You know, if we're using fermented uh, black beans and then fermented soybean on top of this fish, you're not going to taste that fish. I don't care how good your taste buds are, you won't taste that fish. So it's purely a textural experience. And from that fish, I want to cook it that way to achieve that textural experience. And that was really, really a fascinating lesson. And I only learned that last year. And then I stopped, I jumped off that bandwagon of salting all my fish, leaving it to dry out. And I'm like, you know what? I do, I just want it to be light. I want fish to be light. I don't want fish to taste really fishy. You know, I don't want, you know, I just want to have a really light texture to accompany the rest of the dish. Brilliant. Uh, so, I, mean, I was just thinking tweet or blur when, when you're saying all that. So you you can only do that with a with a fresh fish because it's that reaction yeah. of the butter. Um, one of the students has asked, what do you think your, your greatest accomplishment has been when it comes to cooking your perceptions take on Chinese food? Um, you know, as I said, I mean, when, when you talk about, I mean, I, I go back to mission again, right? Because I know a lot of young chefs are fascinated by it. Um, I remember the, the evening we, we got a call from Michelin. Uh, we got a phone call during service time and the, um, the editor of... Are we still on? Yep. All right. So the editor of Michelin uh, called me out and said, oh, you know, Andrew, we've got an event that we would like to invite you to, uh, blah, blah, and it's great. And I remember I called up... Um, our publicist um, and I, I told her and she, remember it would always stick to me all she said to me is Andrew now you've got nothing to prove um, and it's true like we as chefs 
uh, are massively lacking in self-esteem, especially the ones who chase stars. And actually, I'm just as guilty as everyone else. Now, there's no, you know, I, I, I love the fact that we have a star. You know, I also, you know, I'd love to one day somehow win two, you know, whatever. Um, but it's because we lack self-esteem. But so you know, if you talk about greatest achievements, as in like in the pecking order, then yeah, you know, winning a mission star with 10 chefs, 11 chefs who had been kitchen porters is by far the, the biggest to tick, to tick on the list. But actually, eight years down the line now, um, what, is, what is a bigger uh, picture than that is actually when I look around now, um, around London, um, I begin to see people talking about Chinese food differently. And I don't know if it's directly to do because of me, but I would hope that we had some part to play in it in basically getting people to recalibrate the way that they look at Chinese food. That number one, it's not just one thing, uh, one particular province. Number two, it's not just that thing on a Friday night that you eat you know, instead of a kebab or what you eat after a night out. Um, and, and I like to think that, you know, when I see people now, they, they're beginning to make the, the relationships between Chinese food and Chinese history and Chinese medicine, um, that, you know, we had a little bit to play in people's preconceptions. And I think that um, is probably um, a bigger achievement in the grand scheme of things. Brilliant. Okay. Um, just leaves me to say thank you so much. Um, we're going to let you get back. I mean, if, if you can just give a, a little two or three minutes about what you're up to now, and um, now that things are that obviously the restaurants currently shut and things like that. So just if you could let people know what you're up to, and um, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Sure. Well, my literally, up to? we're literally up to. We're all in lockdown, so I have two kids at home. So I'm attempting to homeschool, which is um, harder than any job in the kitchen. Uh, and I've got massive uh, admiration and respect for Mr. Jarvis and, and Mr. Tintin for, 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 for doing it as a, as a job. Um, but actually, you know, as a, as a business owner, there are massive, um, massive things to think about. You know, we, between the two restaurants, we look after 60 staff. And on one of the restaurants, we had to basically um, fire them just before lockdown. Um, but then the government uh, decided to come up with the uh, job retention scheme. So then we had to re-employ everyone. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's a lot of psychological stuff that goes with that, just personally, but also with the staff. Um, you know, for myself personally, I, and one thing that really hit me hard was this idea that you know, there are a lot of these young, young guys, a lot of them from Italy, uh, who were in their early 20s, who had obviously they're away from their home country, away from their parents, and they'd been made redundant overnight with no money, and no idea of how long lockdown would be, and no idea how they're going to feed themselves. So that, from an from emotional and a psychological point of view, that was a big thing to play for me for a long, long time, for several weeks. And I tried my best to do the things that we could do to help them. Um, and now, you know, as the government does different stuff, we need to um, for the different things that we can do to help them as well. And at the same time, we need to keep psychologically um, sane. So all of them are kind of rolling around in their house all day with nothing to do. And, you know, you, you guys haven't spent a prolonged period of time in the industry yet. But basically, you know, for people like myself who had spent 16, 17 years in the industry, our life revolves around dealing with people, interacting, you know, um, making people feel welcome, conversations. And now all of a sudden we don't have that on a daily basis. And that's hard psychologically. So we have to try to find ways as a, as a business owner and as a head chef to try to keep the team um, engaged. So, you know, we, you know we're, we're trying to write an encyclopedia. I'm trying to write a dim sum book. At the same time, I'm talking to the accountant every day of how long we can last, um, how long we can last as a business uh, if lockdown continues. Uh, if we can't last that long, how do we find other revenues um, to bring in extra cash, whether it be um, take on boxes or, or coming up with sources that we can make beautiful and, and sell to people. Um, 
And then, as, uh, the, the thing I, I do want to leave with you guys is that, you know, my career path has been, you know, a very, very specific one. And it, it's not the only one, you know. It, you know, there are many, many um, facets of the hospitality industry. And many times I get young chefs in the, in the kitchen and I look at them. I'm just like, after a week or two or a month or two, I'm just like, you know what? This, this you know, these 13, 14 hour days, five days a week isn't suitable to you. But that doesn't mean hospitality isn't suitable to you. You know, this, this industry is so wide. You can go into you know, hotels or you can go into restaurant PR or you can go into restaurant marketing or you can go into development. Or you know, there's so many different things. Just because you're crap in the kitchen, it doesn't mean that you don't belong in hospitality. You know, people in the kitchen might end up being better suited to front of house. The, some of the best chefs I've ever had have been waiters that I've stolen from the front of house. Like, because we've been so short staffed that I've gone, you, get in the kitchen. And they've just picked it up so quickly and they've enjoyed it. They didn't realize they'd enjoy it. So, you know, as I said, you know, you guys now who are graduating, now you've got the foundation skills and decided what you're going to do with your, your, your life and your career. And I just say, don't think of a kitchen as the only way that you can succeed in hospitality. It's so wide and so broad. And the fact that you have the fundamental kitchen skills, it automatically gives you an advantage over many people. Um, you know, as I said, in marketing, in PR, if you understand chef psychology, you're going to become a better publicist. Now, if you understand chef psychology, you're going to understand, you know, um, chef dynamics and how you market a product. If you understand how dish development works, you're going to understand the best way to, to push a dish onto social media and this and that. Um, so besides that, I'm not going to lie, you know, as, as the situation stands with the government, it, it's, it's winging on a daily basis. You know, I don't know. All I know is that we try to be nice people. We try to do things with a good heart. We try to look after our staff where we can um, to the point that we can still keep the kitchen alive and not have to close down. Um, and then besides that, keep your fingers crossed and just pray that, um, that we can get through this. I mean, I, I wish there was a, um, a better way of describing it and I had the magic formula, but I don't. Amazing. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, listen, we wish our best to you and uh, We'd love to continue supporting you as you supporting us as well. So our fondest wishes to you and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. We're done, we're clear.